CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And um, you are listening, or in the case of those watching on YouTube, you are looking at a couple of hockey writers. Jonah and I have spent uh, this week in Why the Sabres it? press box. You've, you've been a hockey writer longer than I've been a hockey writer. I've probably written more hockey games than basketball games this season. Is that good or bad? I think it's good in some ways. It's good for my career development and pocketbook. Career uh, development. How old are you, Jonah? You know, pushing 40. Yeah. No. You get some good, getting some good clips out of this, are you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those AP leads just sing I, uh, right off the page. I made my return to the arena, uh, and I've been there. I've covered hockey. I've written hockey stories. In fact, some of my – well, not even some of. I think if you were to – I was talking to Kevin Adams about this in the press box Tuesday night. He was, you know, kind of marveling at the fact that, uh, that I was in the press box and covering games this week. It hasn't – I was trying to explain to him that I've written hockey, but I haven't really covered games. And – um that at the athletic, I think if you were to take my top 10 stories, depending on what metric you want to look at subscriptions generated or views or what have you. Um, and I think seven of them are not football stories. They are either hockey stories or in the case of the Kira Klein story, uh, Lex Luger. Um, but most of them are hockey. I would say five of them are hockey. Um, but I actually covered a game last night. I did it in an unorthodox way, uh, given my experience as being a former Sabres beat writer and, and really not doing it for 15 years. Um, I decided to compare the last game I covered uh, to last night in the environment. And so uh, um, after being out there Tuesday to kind of get a lay of the land and reacquaint myself with how things work these days, um, I enjoyed, I enjoyed being at the arena. It was, it was sad uh, to see how much it had atrophied and I knew it. You know, I, I see the games. I know I, I, we talk about it here on the podcast. I read the stories. I know how depressing it is uh, and how small the crowds are and have been for years and years, but to actually be there and to walk around the 300 level and to talk to fans and ask them, on a, on a cold and rainy Thursday night uh, between two of the worst teams in the NHL standings, why are you here? Uh, it, was, um, it was enlightening. What, what's been your experience, Jonah, with, with covering the team this year, being in the press box and going through the grind, I think, uh, a little bit more so than, than me parachuting in for, for a night? Well, my experience is, in the years I've covered the Sabres for the AP and I didn't really cover the Sabres or go to very many games as a fan before that, I've only covered them during this suffering era. The first year I started stringing for AP was not the tank year, but the year before when they kind of were still tanking and they ended up with the number two pick in Sam Reinhardt. And they've really never been a good team in the years that I've covered them. They had some of those win streaks with some hope and you felt like maybe they were coming out of the doldrums, but it didn't play out that way. One interesting note is that the tank year, I think I covered about six games and they had a winning record. If you count some of the ties and things like that, a winning point percentage. So I guess that was good luck in that season. But so this is in a weird way, the best season, the best Sabres team and the most promising Sabres season that I've been around. And also maybe 
the Sabre season where I've covered the most games. Um, usually I cover a lot of games at this point in the season. And, and then John Wilde starts taking over more in the second half of the season. He's at the Olympics now. So I've been doing this homestand. So it hasn't been to me all that depressing. I'm not going to get depressed over it anyways, but. Well, that's not what I mean. Of course, yeah, you know, well, we're, well, we're, we're at a distance and, and we're, we're just disassociated from the actual, you know, there's no emotional investment from us. But I've seen more hope. Maybe more, that's why it's depressing for me as somebody who's just coming in sure. and not being there on a daily basis. Yeah, um, it's the perceptions that you hold coming into the game and the season that kind of alter. That, that's what I mean. I've never seen, yeah. I, I was never there in the building for, um, you know, those, those Stanley Cup finals runs and things like that. And when the team was really connected with the fan base in the city, it's always been this kind of weird love hate relationship between the fans and the teams. And you're you more fresh of that. comparing this to Ralph Kruger's Sabres, whereas but, I'm, but also it to Dan Balzma and, and the different iterations of this yeah. suffering era that they've had Darcy Regeer and things like that at the end, you know, but I haven't seen the glory Hockey days with the, you know, what are the Goo Goo Dolls saying that, you know, that kind of thing, the better days are here again or something like that. I haven't really experienced that a little bit on television and I was editing the Niagara Gazette and putting those stories in the paper. So I understand the team history, but I didn't, I wasn't in the building feeling it and seeing it. I've been in bars that were packed watching Sabres games and knowing how it took over the city. And I think I maybe went to a party in the plaza once, or I was in and around that one time for a playoff game. But so I've seen on the ice, I think you see a lot of encouraging signs from the development of young players and even some games where the Sabres have lost and blown leads, but the goals that they've scored and the way they played for certain periods and certain stretches of the game looked like a much better brand of hockey, more competitive, more exciting. Uh, the culture has changed a lot, I think, in the last year with the team. But with the fan base, it's worse than ever. I mean, they were a worse team last year with bigger crowds. Well, not last year because of the pandemic, but the year before. They've been a worse team with bigger crowds and better fan support than they're getting now. And I think some of that's related to the pandemic and the border closures. But I know just anecdotally reading people posting on their Facebook page or whatever that really gave up on this team in the offseason said, I've been a season ticket holder for years and years, and I'm done, and I'm not coming back. And I'm, I don't think they've reconverted too many of those fans uh, over the past year. I think a lot of people that decided they're going to stay away from this season are still staying away, that nothing they've done so far has changed that, you know, I guess it's some, when somebody kind of breaks up with somebody in a relationship, they divorce from the Sabres and they're not going to change their mind. And I'm not well, sure. Well, one of the ways to, to bring people back to watch this more entertaining style of hockey, and granted, they're still losing too many games, but they're at least scoring goals. Ralph Kruger's teams lost and were boring. This These teams fight. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, throwing fists. I mean, they battle. They, they have pride. Um, there's been additions by subtractions, you know, with Sam Reinhart and Jack, Re uh, Jack Eichel no longer on the roster. It seems that there's been, um, it's almost like a, use a, a metaphor. Maybe I'm making a reach here, but when you trim a tree uh, and you take out some branches and it all of a sudden it, it, it thrives and you see the tree grow because you, you cleared out some of the, the stuff that's yeah. uh, that's been, um, you know, detracting too much of the, the water and the sunlight and, uh, and, and, uh, all right, I'm too far, too far gone I mean, on that I, metaphor. I don't know. That it the works, energy but. is way different. I, I, it's more like this team's gotten a blood transfusion. Even if they don't, yeah, play and win that much differently, the, the vibe is a lot different from the players. The way they interact with the media and some of those, what do you want to call them? Big nets that they play on the scoreboard. You can just see they're a much more likable team, even if, and they are better. But even if they're not that much better on the ice it seems like a team that's a lot easier to root for i think jack eichel was a little bit unfair some of the criticisms of his attitude and his body language and things like that but it, there was also i think some fair commentary on the fact that he didn't have the most engaging leadership style and personality and i think in some ways for some fans he was hard to root for sam reinhardt the same thing rasmus ristolein and in maybe a different way he had a bit more personality but on the ice, I think he was hard to root for sometimes. So Alex Tuck, as good as he's playing, is also a very 
likable, engaging personality. And I think he's converted a lot of, he's made a lot of new fans because of the intangibles that he brings to the team. And if he's the captain next year, like a lot of us expect him to be, I think that that's going to be good for the franchise, even if he doesn't produce a point per game every single night. It's, I think, what he brings to the locker room and the bench and the fans and the city and being a Sabres fan growing up, I think that's really good for reigniting the fan base. It has turned out to be significant. Uh, I rolled my eyes at the time of the trade about this aspect of the trade and Alex Tuck. Um, but it's turned out to be significant that he really wants to be here and he's proud to be a Sabre. And that's not necessarily a given. Uh, in fact, you would assume that being traded to Buffalo is a sentence of some kind. You saw it with Eric Stahl. You saw it with Sabotka. You saw it with, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the guy who uh, didn't report uh, after the Ryan O'Reilly trade, essentially just quit hockey. Um but yeah, to have Alex Tuck come here and to be all in with uh, the turnaround and wanting to be somebody that this organization pivots on uh, is been, has been a substantial push, I think, for the roster, uh, for the development, for the evolution of the culture, like you say, um, especially coming from a team like Vegas, a really good team, a Stanley Cup contender. He's giving up that. Uh, and uh, Kevin Adams, I'm sure, knew that, and that was a, a component of, of what Alex Tuck was all about as somebody who grew up as a Sabres fan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Patrick Berglund, uh, the player uh, who uh, now comes to mind, uh, who didn't, uh, didn't want to report after the Ryan O'Reilly trade. Um, but, yeah, Alex Tuck uh, coming here and wanting to be in on it uh, is, has been really cool. And, but, but one of the things that you don't see um, – the hook that you'd get from fans to watch these games, to see how the, the, the games are entertaining, the goaltending aside, but at least they're scoring goals and they're having fun. People aren't watching on TV anymore either. And I think that that's something that the Sabres as an organization really needs to find a way to get people to check out the team again and to give it another chance. Um, look, I, I talked to some fans last night when I asked, why are you here? Um, uh, there was one couple uh, that was there just because it happened to be uh, his birthday. She bought him a couple of tickets to the game, $10 seats. I mean, that's, that's cheaper than a night at the movies. Um, in many cases, they had some of the worst seats in the house, but also, Hey, let's face it. Uh, there are a lot of empties and they don't have nearly as many ushers as they would for a capacity crowd. So you can move around in that arena uh, fairly easily. Uh, so you get your $10 seats uh, and go have a night like you would, Unfortunately, I don't mean to be it as a sounded as a knock, but it was actually mentioned in the in the comments uh, underneath my story. A reader brought up the fact of just the entertainment value, like going to a movie, uh, like going to Dave and Buster's, like maybe having a night at the bar instead. Go watch a game and, and have your beers in, in front of, with a hockey game, reminiscent of like a Bison's game. And that type of fandom isn't enough to support an NHL franchise. Um that's a, again, that's a minor league baseball uh, fan base that you're talking about with the casual, hey, let's go check out a game because it's not expensive. But um, those are the types of experiences that I think are going to be necessary to get people interested in the team again to give it a chance. Uh, I went to one game and had fun. I'm going to go to another. Uh, I'm watching the game on TV. Uh, they scored uh, four goals. They lost, but I got to see Alex Tuck and, and, and Krebs and and, and Darlene had made some nice plays and um, you know, there's these young players are coming. Casey Middlestat's coming back and all these types of things. Um, you got the, uh, another, according to the athletic, uh, the Sabres have the best prospects in the NHL yet again, in terms of their pool and in their future. Um, so I think it's encouraging as, as sad as it was for me, to go back into Key Bank Center last night and think back on the echoes that I would hear um, or how you'd have to walk sideways on the concourse back in those days. Because what I used to do, um, the press box food back then was awful. I used to go down to the 300 level and, and get concession food and then bring it back up to the press box. And to have to navigate those lines and even walk through the crowds, you know, to shuffle through sideways because it was so jam-packed. Um, that's the 300 level I'm talking about. 
And the 300 level, as the team took the ice for warmups at 6.29 p.m., I looked at the clock, the 300 level for a stretch of, I counted, four concession stands with food, three two, two beer kiosks or beer stations, the customer service window, the 50-50 raffle kiosk, uh, there was a popcorn cart and a Perry's ice cream cart, there was the Lakeshore station windows, two of them massive at the, at the landing where you come up on the escalator at the 300 level and a Lenovo pizza window. And I'm probably missing a couple of other things too. Empty, zero fans total combined. It wasn't even like people were standing in line, maybe thinking at the window. And I thought, oh, that doesn't count. No, it was concession workers, you know, arms crossed, flat out, just leaning across the counter, checking their phones. I mean, it was, it, it was terrible to see um well and something that but your, your colleague I, john vogel has documented well on a number of occasions the arena is long overdue for updates and renovations and a new coat of paint and kind of the concourses are outdated and not the experience that a new arena gives to fans these days and i think that is a somewhat of a factor in the atmosphere and, and people not going out just for the entertainment factor of being at the games. Um, but another thing, you know, I've been in that arena when it's pretty vacant for sectional high school hockey games and world junior classic games that didn't involve the U.S. and Canada. Those are pretty small crowds. And big four basketball games don't get very big crowds um, in that and for a lot of times so over the recent years. But they – they do a better job in some of those events of bringing the fans closer to the ice or closer to the floor. I think that one of the problems is, so they're averaging eight, 9,000 fans this season on paper, but it's really four or 5,000 fans in the building most of these nights and they're scattered about. It looks emptier than it really is. And if I think if they could find a way to let people sit closer, tape off some of these top sections and bring the fans closer to the ice, closer together, get it more because four or 5,000 people in a different venue is a big crowd. So I think there's ways you can create more atmosphere and make it feel more like not a sellout, but more like a full building. If you let the fans congregate together and be a crowd closer to the ice, closer to the floor. And I think in another way, find ticket promotions to get more people in the door, more kids. Tomorrow's a kid's day. So maybe you'll see some of that, but more kids, more high school hockey players or high school age, college age uh, fans and get new fans in the door and get some people that have disconnected with this fan base back in the building. And hopefully it's an exciting game. Like when, when they beat the Islanders the other night, and that makes people want to keep coming back. We've also talked about this on the podcast the last couple of weeks that when the bills are as good as they are right now, it really sucks all the air out of the room and everybody's just such a passionate bills fan and spending all of their entertainment dollars on the bills, and, you know, shirts and Zubas pants and all that kind of stuff. And I think that not a lot of fans can have that kind of passion for more than one team. And I think at some of the points in time when the Sabres really took over this city, it was because people were fed up with the bills and wanted to redirect their energy into fandom for the Sabres. And that's not happening right now and probably not going to happen anytime soon. So I, I do wonder if the Sabres really got hot, if they had another 10 game winning streak to open next season, you know, they kind of did that this year in a way, if that would get the fan base excited again or what it would take to get the fan base excited. Cause this fan base was more excited for the team tanking for Connor McDavid or Jack Eichel than they are about yeah, anything right. they're doing positive right now. Right. Um, at convenient too, if you're, uh, listening to this podcast and you're thinking about taking your family out to the game, uh, Colorado avalanche, uh, the game tomorrow at uh, one o'clock, you mentioned it's a kid's day, Colorado avalanche, uh, the best team in hockey. Um, so give that a, give that a look. Um, and it's an and afternoon game. Teams that are closer, Philadelphia, some of the New York teams, you see a good number of visiting fans. That's probably not good for the Sabres and the atmosphere, but if you are just a straight sports fan, a straight NHL fan or a fan of another team, you know, it's pretty easy to get a good seat and watch your favorite team these days. If you were among the fans uh, who were interested uh, in the Jack Eichel return, you saw the Cal Colorado Avalanche win that thrilling game one to nothing. Um, 
Go ahead and uh, state your case about Jack Eichel's uh, return Wednesday night. Well, so when I heard he was playing, I was a little bit interested in watching that. I thought it was a significant NHL, Vegas Golden Knights, TNT now taking over uh, the national broadcast for the NHL, a significant television event from that perspective. And it would be interesting to see how Jack Eichel looked, if he was healthy, how well he played. But then seeing some of the tweets, it, I just thought the energy in Buffalo, the rhetoric was way too hot for that. It, I feel like that's always been the case with Jack Eichel and the tank season that preceded his arrival, that everybody just has strong feelings, positive or negative, about him and, and the Sabres and how it makes them feel about the Sabres. And I didn't think it was a huge Buffalo sporting event the other night that Jack Eichel was finally playing a game. Maybe there's a point in time when he plays in a playoff or Stanley Cup final game. And I think that that's maybe a bit more of a time for Sabres fans to have their reckoning about how it didn't work out with Jack Eichel. But him just returning to the ice, you know, in a way it was the biggest Sabres game of the year and the Sabres weren't playing. I think I might agree with you. Uh, in that regard, Jonah, I do think it was a big Sabres game, but I disagree with your take that it was too, you know, ginned up in terms of uh, the hype or the uh, the attention given to that game. Because what you were watching Wednesday night when Jack Eichel was on the ice, and you will for the next few games until he starts to round into form, is the Buffalo Sabres medical staff. Uh, you're seeing Kevin Adams. You're looking at the Sabres right there. That was the whole thing that the Sabres didn't think he should have this surgery because he wasn't going to be able to play at a certain caliber. So you're watching Jack Eichel because you're learning more about whether the Sabres knew what they were doing uh, regarding his medical procedure. Now we can talk about the trade. I think that's different. Um, and I think that we're in agreement that Kevin Adams, while we can't say he won the trade, he at least did pretty well for himself, I think, given, uh, given the circumstances. Uh, but to watch Jack Eichel take the ice when everybody had a pretty strong opinion as to whether he should be allowed to have this neck surgery because it was a, a disc replacement in the neck. And it had never been done before with an NHL player. And that was the trepidation from the Sabres side. The Vegas Golden Knights clearly did not have that trepidation, else they wouldn't have traded for him and allowed him to have the surgery right away. And I think there are a lot of teams out there that were willing to let him have that surgery and didn't see it the same way the Sabres did. So as you watch, you're looking as to whether or not this is an indictment on how the Sabres handled the Jack Eichel injury. And so I do think it still has a, a lag. There is a, a carryover from he's, he's still very much a Sabres issue um, now we can yeah, talk I, about how the fact that you cut the cord and he is now a Vegas golden Knight, and the Sabres have two players that the fans seem to really like and have endeared themselves to the fans because of how they have performed on the ice, but also the, 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 the promise of Peyton Krebs, uh, and Alex Tuck and the leadership and everything. When you thought, Oh my gosh, here comes another Ryan O'Reilly situation. Uh, the Sabres are going to get fleeced. Um, Jack is going to go on and win five Stanley cups and, uh, the Sabres aren't going to get anything because they have no leverage. And we have a general manager who's never done this before. And I count me among those who seriously, you know, had, had strong misgivings about whether or not Kevin Adams would be able to, to do anything that, that, uh, resembled, uh, competency, uh, regarding tr all because of the circumstances, not necessarily how smart he is, but. The fact that he was a rookie GM handling a, a really strange situation, uh, unprecedented situation, really. Um, but um, but anyway, I, I thought that it, I was really into Wednesday night's game just from a curiosity standpoint. Not necessarily I was rooting one way or the other, but I just wanted to see what, what's this guy look like. Can he take a hit? Uh, how many does he look like he's in pain? Uh, is he going to get run? Uh, the Colorado Avalanche, really good team. Uh, two of the best teams uh, in that conference uh, going against each other. A lot of juice in that game. Uh, let's uh, let's see what what this what, what Jack Eichel has. And it was a letdown in most of those. It games. was one nothing game, and you know Jack Eichel had two penalties, um, but I don't think they were penalties born out of being out of shape or like I, it was. It was just it was just a weird game. Because um, Jack Eichel is an excellent player, but I think Sabres fans know this as well as anybody. 
he's not the superstar takeover the game player, especially from a goal scoring standpoint that some people think he is and some sort of guarantee that he was going to go out there and make his imprint on the game. And I'm not surprised that he kind of wasn't able to do that. I think it's going to take him some time to integrate into that team and do what he does best, which is playmaking and passing. And he's a strong skater, but he's not a guy that's going to go out there and get a hat trick in his first game just for the entertainment value of it. Yeah. Um, And that's one of the things I I interviewed Rick Tockett, the uh, TNT analyst, uh, and I say that like that's the thing he's most known for. Uh, you know, Rick Tockett, you know, 400 some goals and a, won a Stanley Cup with the Penguins and coached in the NHL a bunch. And um, I interviewed him because the game was on TNT. And he mentioned how he thinks that this is a win. Of, this, this trade was won by both teams because Jack Eichel had to, get, had to be dealt. He goes to a team where he's probably going to play very well because he doesn't have to be the nexus of the Las Vegas golden Knights. He is, uh, he can kind of slide in. He doesn't need to be the leader. He doesn't have to wear a letter. He doesn't have all the hopes and dreams on his back. Like he did in Buffalo. Uh, Vegas has a bunch of leadership type guys uh, who will, you know, pull him along and let him be whatever he, whatever the most he can be uh, theoretically. Um it's the situation he needed when he was drafted that Buffalo was on. Yeah, you're right. You're him. absolutely right. And that's one of the points that Tockett, maybe he didn't specifically say, but he clearly was suggesting. And you know, recall the story that I did for the athletic last season where I interviewed uh, five former Sabres captains um, anonymously. So that way they could speak their minds without fear of, you know, upsetting future employers or maybe even current employers. Um, and uh, that was one of the most common threads is that Jack Eichel, not to knock on him for not being a leader. I mean, it was viewed as an insult from Sabres fans. Like this guy's not a leader. Well, okay. That, that happens. The problem being is that he had to be the leader um, because there so much was invested in him and there was nobody else. They needed, they needed four more Kyle Posos. They probably needed a Matt Molson, you know, to still be around. I mean, you're not going to win anyway. So, you know, keep you, you needed these leadership guys on the roster so he can learn how to be a pro, uh, what you need to do uh, on a night to night basis when you're going through uh, a losing streak as much as when you're going through a winning streak, how you handle yourself, uh, how you get ready the next day, uh, what happens when you're going through a, a personal slump. Maybe the team's playing well, but you haven't scored in 12 games. I mean, there's all kinds of things that that he didn't have around him. And uh, one of the captains that I interviewed for that story made it a point to say that, you know, back during those Sabres, uh, those Sabres Sabres teams during the aughts, there would be seven guys who could wear a letter or even be the captain, James Patrick, Jay McKee, Teppo Newmanen. Um, You know, I'm trying to think, you know, that was Briere and and Drury, obviously on those teams. Um, I'm trying to think, and there's probably still some really obvious ones uh, that aren't popping into my head right now, but um, JP Dumont. I mean, there was a, there were just a ton of guys everywhere you looked, there was leadership. Uh, whereas Jack Eichel, you know, it was, it just, just wasn't there. And, um, and I think that he, that, I think that hindered his development. That's one of the points that the Tockett made in, in the Q and a that I did with him. Yeah, well, in the story you wrote about Jack Eichel being a an underwhelming captain, I think that was before he hurt his neck, correct? Or right before he really it knew the situation yeah, with his neck. And so well, I guess my point there is that Jack Eichel was on his way to getting traded before the neck injury situation. And that was a bizarre, complicated, and in some ways embarrassing situation for the Sabres. I think it made it harder for them to trade Jack Eichel, but it isn't. I don't think that's the reason he's not on the team anymore. In fact, in some ways, I think it kept him here longer than maybe they would have if he was completely (laughs) healthy. And and the way I think the Sabres mismanaged that situation is I thought they should have let him get the surgery he wanted. One, because I think that that's the ethical way to deal with somebody in a player's injury if if that was really what he wanted to do. But two, I think they might have been able to get a better return for Jack Eichel if they let him get the surgery, get healthy, come back, prove he was healthy with that first game back was here in Buffalo, and then they could shop a healthy Jack Eichel around the NHL instead of an injured Jack Eichel with a surgery that 
maybe some teams didn't want to deal with it. There, I have to assume there was at least one other team or at least a few other teams in the NHL that felt the same way the Sabres did and didn't agree with Jack, I- Jack Eichel's do- doctors. But getting back, the reason I thought that that was – overcooked is the Jack Eichel's re-debut the other night is because, I mean, I just don't think Jack Eichel is the Babe Ruth of hockey and that this was the greatest player to ever leave Buffalo. There's a lot of very good players. The Wayne Gretzky of hockey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of very good players that franchises try to build around in all different sports that don't work out, that get traded from the first team that they play for. And sometimes it is a – low point for a franchise when they have to do that. But oftentimes teams uh, get better from those situations. And a lot, I've seen a lot of trades, particularly in the NBA where a star player gets traded and the return is a lot less than what the Sabres got for Jack Eichel or a year or two later, those players aren't on the team anymore. And it was really just a salary dump. So I I just don't think that going forward, we're going to keep looking back or we should keep looking back at how the Sabres screwed up this Jack Eichel era and that it's going to be this dark cloud hanging over the franchise for years and years and years. In fact, I think Jack Eichel, for reasons that weren't really his fault, but in a lot of ways, his presence was the dark cloud, the tank season and the failures that they had in building around him over the last few years and the way it ended. That was the dark cloud, and trading him away and getting some sort of positive return for him has lifted that malaise from the franchise. I think Early in the season when the Sabres were playing well, there was still that, well, what about Jack Eichel? Now that's gone. So there's, I think, a little bit of relief in that that's not something that Sabres fans and the Sabres themselves have to think very much about anymore. And I can understand if you're a fan of Jack Eichel and you were entertained to watch that game. But if you were watching that game because it made you feel some type of way about the Sabres, I think you need to let that all go and just kind of move on. I agree with that. And um, I would say if you wanted to watch that game, or you want to watch the Sabres uh, on Saturday afternoon, but uh, aren't quite ready uh, to invest money in tickets or the concessions. And I get that or drive downtown and pay the parking. You can watch all the college and pro games, all the pay-per-views, mixed martial arts, the boxing, whatever. Elimination chamber. I don't uh, know about that. I don't know. I don't know if they do that, but I'm talking about Amherst pizza and ale house at 55 cross point parkway in Getzville. That's right off of Millersport Highway in the 990. Amherst Pizza and Ale House has so many TVs, you won't know what to do with yourself, especially if you're wagering illegally on, uh, on the sporting events of your choosing, as I've been doing. Too much Olympic hockey. I used to think I knew what was going on internationally with hockey. When's the last time you won a bet? Was it the 2018 Eastern Conference Final? <laughs> well, I didn't bet back then. Uh, it feels like it's been a long time. I, I actually, uh, well, we'll get into that, but let me, let me finish telling people about Amherst Pizza and Ale House, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Uh, you can stop in, call for takeout and delivery, 716-625-7100. Again, 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Um, you should, I made, on, you should bet on the Colorado Avalanche. I think they're 17, one and two, if, if I got that correct, since the start of the year. Well, my guess is that um, my guess is that Colorado is not a big return on investment uh, with that uh, playing against the Sabres. Um, I could probably call it up here. You're probably but, right. But um, in terms of uh, wagering, Jonah, I, I've really kind of uh, eased off of it quite a bit. I, I think. Um, and I think this is natural. You know, I enjoyed it because of the accessibility. Um, was up some, was down some. Uh, I made about seven, eight bets on the Super Bowl. I ended up losing like 20, 25 bucks, all told. Um, and the next day, uh, you know, some of the Olympic stuff, the Olympic hockey, like I said, um, wagered on some of that. But I'm just not, it's just not as fun anymore. I think the Super Bowl was such a big event. And I'm like, eh, I'm kind of over it. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be doing a lot of betting anymore, but well, we just, just last night, we had a couple of beers. I didn't, I didn't place any bets. I didn't, I didn't, there was still some stuff going on on TV. I didn't pay any attention to it. <laughs> they were playing the replay of a game that you were just at. You might've been able to get You're right. You're right. 
I, I could have made a, a, a Jason I, Barstool to bet what was going to happen. I could have bet you're right. There were a couple of people there that might have taken that bet. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you're going to be covering uh, Avalanche at Sabres tomorrow, one o'clock downtown. And because of that, you're going to miss Niagara Canisius uh, tomorrow afternoon. Big rivalry game. I know you love your uh, big four rivalry games. Well, this is uh, usually a fun game to cover because it's the the best atmosphere you're going to get at a Canisius game every year. And sort of the same, definitely the same thing with Niagara over the years. When they were very good years ago, you got atmospheres just about every night. But Niagara Canisius draws the student crowd and the community crowd in a way that doesn't happen when these teams don't play each other or don't play one of the other local teams. Uh, I do wonder on a Saturday afternoon of a holiday weekend if the students will really turn out tomorrow at Canisius, especially both of these teams have losing records and aren't really having great seasons. But, yeah, I'm a little disappointed. I I had thought about maybe giving up the Sabres game to go to Canisius Niagara. It didn't work out that way um, because it is usually one of the fun games. And I like watching the local teams play each other because that gives a good – way to gauge how good the teams and certain players are just just for me seeing how they match up with each other uh just gives me a good sense of who's good this year and you know how good these players are compared to previous Niagara Canisius teams and Niagara Canisius players and things like that now we talked uh, about big four basketball uh, last week we gave a pretty good rundown I don't think much has changed but um March Madness is bit. in our I mean, sights we have, uh, you know, the, the, the tournament is going to be in Buffalo uh, this year. Uh, as we hit in the home stretch here, any do you, what are your updated thoughts on, well, on the Big Four I think team? the big thing that's changed since, you know, when we podcast last week, this was starting to maybe develop them, but is that St. Bonaventure's really gotten hot. They've won, is it four, four in a row, but they had two, they had a back-to-back home-and-home home wins over St. Louis, which was, one of the higher rated teams in the Atlantic 10 at the time, they dropped a little bit because of those losses. St. Bonaventure's moved up now to fifth in the eight ten, a half game behind St. Louis for fourth, which is significant because that fourth spot is get to that double buy in the eight ten tournament. Bon is up to 86 in net. Now I think before these St. Louis games, they were one oh one, which if you, and their Ken Palm was similar. I mean, if you're really just looking at those power ratings, that's a borderline NIT team or a borderline outside of the NIT team. And now there may be, pushed up beyond that point and uh, Joe Lunardi has them the 11th team out in his latest bracketology which isn't a spot where you're going to get into the tournament obviously you're 11 teams out at that point but and the A-10's more than likely a one bid league this year I think if Bonaventure wins out and loses in the A-10 final they might be in the conversation and I think at that point they'd be kind of a first four team out at that point but it kind of shows that they're surging and surging at the right time, getting healthier. Kyle Lofton set the school assist record the other night was 17. You can tell that that ankle injury, that high ankle sprain that usually is slow to develop. We saw that with Jack Eichel earlier in his career is feeling better and he's playing better. I think St. Bonaventure as a team is playing better. They've got their mojo back. As Mark Schmidt has said, they're healthier, they're winning games. Uh, But the thing that's really going to be interesting is, if you project, if you look at the standings and who's favored and think that they're projected to be a team that's where they are right now, fifth in the A-10 and a half game out of fourth with a game against George Washington that got canceled and hasn't been rescheduled yet. And that might be rescheduled, it might not. And that might be the difference between whether they get that double bye or not in the A-10 tournament. And where's George Washington? George Washington's lower in the standings. I think something like eighth. I can look up their record. But yeah, you know, not important. the question is whether – that game's going to happen and whether the A-10 is going to force that game to happen or whether George Washington's not going to want to play that game or they're not going to be able to find a date and how forceful St. Bonaventure and the A-10 are going to be in making sure that game happens. Or if Bonaventure wins enough games and St. Louis drops a few games and Bonaventure gets into that fourth spot without making up that game and then it might not be necessary. Uh, you know, it's an also another win on the schedule that could help Bonaventure in their bubble case or their seating in the NIT and just the overall win total of the season. I think they had two games. They had a non-conference game and this game that were canceled. And that just, if those don't get made up, it just lowers the total number of wins you can have in the season, which doesn't 
matter for everything, but it matters a little bit. It matters in the long run, looking back on how many games they've won and when you're putting together the brackets and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see whether that game gets made up and whether Bonaventure can keep this hot streak going. They play at home against Duquesne tomorrow. And it does seem like they're going to finish strong in February going into March, which is what you want to do. But they're not that top 25 at-large bid, surefire NCAA team. They're probably going to have to win the Atlantic 10 to get into the tournament. And they look like a team that can do that. But, you know, they're not the favorites to win the Atlantic 10. And we'll see how that plays out from there. Another big game in Western New York, uh, it'll be tonight. In fact, a couple of them, a double header at uh, Damon, uh, the men and women playing St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Thomas Aquinas, I, I guess it's essentially uh, kind of, it's going to determine the conference, right? St. Thomas Aquinas and Damon are, are both uh, the, more, at the top. More or less, especially if Damon wins, because Damon had a win at St. Thomas Aquinas earlier this year. And so if they win this game, I think they would clinch the conference, but maybe they have some games left. So mathematically it would not clinch, but they would effectively clinch the conference. And in that case, they would get home court advantage for the conference tournament. And that would make it a lot more likely that they make the NCAA division two tournament, even though they could be an at large team, even without winning the conference, you know, they've never won the East coast conference tournament championship. They won the regular season once before. But they have the pedigree to get into the tournament, right? Yeah, they they do. They're 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 a widely respected program. Well, yeah, and it's more mathematical at the Division II level. They're fifth in these regional rankings right now, and eight teams get in. The problem for Damon is that their conference isn't strong overall, their RPI. So they're not never really a surefire team because of the way it it goes on paper. And same thing with St. Thomas Aquinas. And if you win the conference, you're automatically in. But being fifth in this latest round of regional rankings, unless they slip up with a lot of losses down the stretch, I think they are going to get in. But you need to win the conference to really guarantee that you're going to get in. And also that helps with your seeding. And on the women's side of things, I think because even though the women, the women have won 13 in a row and have a little bit of a better record than the men, they're 15-3, and three, the men are 16-7, and seven, but their conference overall is weaker. So they might have a little bit of a harder time getting into the NCAA tournament if they don't win the conference, but they're more of the favorites to win the East coast conference title. And just overall, I mean, they've won 13 in a row. Damon won 12 in a row. I think for both of these programs, they haven't lost since December. They always play these double headers at either home or on the road. So if you are a Damon fan or interested in watching division two basketball, it's really been an exciting season seeing both of these teams and Andrew Cisco's, senior, senior, super senior, senior season (laughs) and uh, kind of marv, you know, you marvel at the records that he set. Andrew Sisko's played more seasons in Buffalo than Bob McAdoo. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and and he's been here. That's a good line. Actually, He's been here six years and he's played in five seasons. However, it's not like he's played a thousand games or something like that. He, he's played 127 games and he's got a few more left on the schedule. And it's kind of going to break down to about four and a half seasons of basketball. Cause last year they only played 16 games and he played in 15 of them. So while he has, it does feel like he's been here a long time. I think he's been here a lot longer than, uh, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> you know, he, he's been around a long time and I think he's going to stay here. I think he's going to keep living here and, and, maybe coach with Damon at some point and after his professional career is over. But it's not like he's played six full seasons and these records are there because he's played hundreds more games than everybody else. He's played a few more games than what mostly you get out of a four-year career, but only about a half season extra. We didn't really uh, talk about the uh, women's basketball scene uh, when we did the uh, spin around uh, the big four last week. Uh, I want to mention UB women. Uh, they've won six of their last seven with the only loss coming in overtime at Northern Illinois. They're in second place in the Mid-American Conference, uh, 11 and four in the conference, 17 and eight overall. Uh, they're right behind Toledo. Well, I don't want to say right behind because that makes it seem, but Toledo actually has a, has a three game lead on them. Uh, but right now you're talking about uh, going into the conference tournament and seeding and that type of thing. Uh, UB is a couple of games ahead of Akron uh, in third place. Um, 
I don't want to pretend to know more about UB's uh, program or Felicia Lega Jack uh, and what she's uh, what she's done this year. I know you're a lot more familiar with it, so I'll leave that to you. Well, they're 17 and eight. They're second in the MAC, as you mentioned. 77 in the net rankings right now, which is maybe a little bit outside of that bubble for at-large considerations. But the MAC has been a two-bid league in many of recent seasons. The NCAA women's tournament has now expanded to 68 teams, so it's a little bit easier to get an at-large bid for a school like the MAC. I don't know if UB is quite at that level where they can get in as the second team in the MAC right now, but they're pushing into that level if they say they went out and lose to Toledo in the MAC title game. And they're good enough to go to the MAC tournament and beat Toledo. They won that tournament before when they weren't the number one seed, and this is as talented of a UB team as. Felicia Leggett Jacks ever had. The Asia Fair is one of the best guards in the country. It just has some incredible stat lines night to night. Georgia Woolley is a freshman they brought in from, I think she's from Australia, if not Germany, overseas, who's had a very good impact on the team. Summer Hemphill is a player in the middle who's been at UB, I think, longer than Andrew Sisko has been at Damon, or at least in the same situation. She's in that sixth season. She went over 1,000 rebounds last week. She went over 1,000 points earlier in the season. I think one through five with the starting lineup and even some of the players off the bench, this is the best team that the UB women have had. And they've had some really good teams. They, they've been to the sweet 16 before um, they play at home tomorrow in a doubleheader with the UB men, UB men have won five in a row. I think they, they're averaging over 90 points in that stretch. They are averaging over winning by 21 points in that stretch. It's been a softer point in the schedule, but you're seeing them kind of round into that, Mac favorite type team that they were at the beginning of the season. The problem with the UB men is they're, they're fourth in the conference right now. They're one and three against the teams ahead of them. And then I don't know if they've lost a game against the teams behind them, or they might've lost one. So they're showing that they're in that upper tier of the conference, but are they in that top tier of the Mac? And you won't, you'll see that March 1st, they played Toledo at home. Toledo is the best team, the number one team, at least in the Mac right now. And then they go to the Mac tournament and, They'll have opportunities to play Toledo and Ohio and teams like that again. Before we get to March, we're not really going to get to see a game that, that tells us really how good UB is, other than just seeing how much they're smacking teams around. They scored 112 points the other night uh, in their win. I think that was against Central Michigan. No, that was at Bowling Green. And so, you know, things are looking good for UB, but it's still a bit of a mystery how far they can go in March and how good this team can be in the end. What are the latest projections regarding the teams that uh, would come to Buffalo for the first round of the NCAA tournament? Well, I mean, I could look up kind of what Lunardi has specifically, but one thing I can say is off the top of my head is that, and I think we're going to see, if not, I don't know if it's Sunday or Monday, the NCAA put out their first kind of official, these are the top 16 seeds if the selection Sunday was today. And what you're going to see there, because the top 16 seeds are the top four seeds in each region, and those are get preferred locations and where they're set in the NCAA tournament. And if you look at who's likely to be in that top 16, it's not very many teams from the Northeast region where we are in that would want Buffalo as their preferred site. So what that means is you're not going to see too many, really any of the number one, number two, even number three seeds sent to Buffalo. So you're not going to see the 116 game, the 215 game, so on and so forth. You're going to see a lot of four and five seeds, and four seeds would come with a five, a three seed would come to the six, things like that. Which So you don't see the top ten teams in the country, the, the teams that might be playing in the final four, the national championship teams, but you're going to see more competitive games, more likely first-round upsets, and definitely more competitive second round games. Those four or five games, six, three games are usually the best games in the second round of the NCAA tournament. So yeah, and you could see teams like Texas I've seen projected here. Alabama, that would be a very interesting storyline. Providence is one of the local team or one of the Northeast teams that I think you could see here. Villanova as well. Maybe Mike so, Rodak will come back and watch his uh and watch his Friars. That would be a big weekend for Mike Rodev. He gets sent here to cover Alabama, and his Friars are here as well. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the other teams I've seen sent here, but those are the only ones that really came to mind right now. Iona. 
Iona will be a lot. lower seed, but I've seen them on that line as well. Ohio, I've seen as well as a team that could be here. I don't think if Buffalo or St. Bonaventure or so forth made the tournament that they would play here, even though Canisius right. and Niagara are the ones hosting, and so those are the right. only ones that would be that's frowned upon for playing here. But yeah, with the exception of your, that. you got to be a number one or number two seed to for that. Right. For I that thought move. if Bonner was good enough to be a top four seed, you might see that, but uh, you know that's not going to happen. Well, a big sports weekend here in Western New York. Uh, you want to check out uh, college basketball. You have the UB doubleheader tomorrow afternoon. Uh, you have the Damon doubleheader this evening. You have Sabres Avalanche tomorrow afternoon. You have Can- uh, Niagara at Canisius tomorrow afternoon. So, um, again, uh, we were talking about those uh, those fans who might be willing to spend a couple of bucks uh, just like you would go to the movies and check out for some entertainment value. Not enough of those fans to go around to, uh, to patronize all these events uh, tomorrow. So, uh, you know, you hate to see the avalanche draw uh, away from that uh, Niagara Canisius game, but they're going to get at least one. And, and that's, uh, and that's Jonah Bronstein of the new Bronstein time. Yeah, but I'm not paying for a ticket or right. I'm not even spending my money at the concession stand. Either way. Well, Jonah, um, good talk as always. Uh, I think that uh, next week uh, we'll probably be getting back into some football. Uh, the, the dust is starting to settle. I'm, I'm finally getting the appetite to talk about football again, and maybe we'll get into oh, uh, some so Buffalo long. Bills uh, free agency, uh, what they might be looking at in the draft. I'm sorry, what was that? I've just been so long. I forgot what, what it was like to talk about football. Right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for this, Jonah. <laughs> and thank you out there for listening and or watching uh, Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. And let me also ask, I don't do it enough. Uh, please uh, subscribe to this podcast on your platform of choice, whether it be Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. And give us, uh, and a, give rating, us a rating too, uh, if you're so kind. That's important. I'm sorry. I just said that. Yeah, that's important. Rating it is. It, it's important to our uh, to our wherewithal. Have a great weekend, everybody. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.